I'm here with Shannon Gavin Johnson of the True County Archives. Is that the right title? Kind of. Well, how would you describe it? Uh, Troop County Historical Society's Archives and Legacy Museum on Main. That's a mouthful. It is. And what do you do here at the Troop uh, County something something? <laughs> Officially, I am the executive director. Ooh, that's, so, a, that's a fancy title. Yeah. What do you do as the executive director? Um, mostly I manage staff and budgets. Okay. So. What does that look like on a day-to-day basis? A lot of paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a really great staff who handles a lot of the historical stuff. Um, I do still get to do a good bit of writing. Okay. Uh, we have a quarterly publication that I write for and format. And we also have uh, several other uh, opportunities for me to write, such as the brief moments in history that the city of LaGrange does. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoy writing for those. But for the most part, I manage and and handle budgets. Okay. And you also make short videos. Is that is that Yes. Right? Those are the videos for the city of LaGrange. Okay, so they are for the city. They're not for mm-hmm. the historical society. Or... The city approached us. Adam Spees, the, the new coordinator for, uh, I think his official title is media coordinator, I believe. Okay. Um, I'm not sure his official title, but he approached us and asked if we would want to do a, w- a weekly video. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we were excited to be a part of that. Um, it's good publicity for us. It's uh, good um, in keeping with our mission to educate the public of our local history. Mm-hmm. So we've really enjoyed being a part of that. Yeah, and it's been great content. Oh, Absolutely well, wonderful you. content. Thank you. I know I always enjoy watching them. Good, thanks. Hopefully my listeners enjoy watching them too. I hope so. And... We've gotten a lot of good feedback, so yeah. Awesome. How long have you done this job in LaGrange? So in LaGrange, with the exception of one other position... I have only done this job in LaGrange. I started a master's in 2010 and needed some experience, needed some internship opportunities. Mm -hmm. So um, I was living in Manchester at the time and looked for the closest archives and this was it. So I reached out to the director at that time and asked if I could come give my services for free. They let me. (laughs) I worked as an intern for about four or five months when um, a gentleman, the previous archivist, retired and I was able to do that job for part-time until I graduated from my, graduated with my master's degree and began working full-time in 2012. I did that for two or three years then served as assistant director, and and now I'm the director. Wow, that's quite the um, advertisement for our, um, internships. It, it has, it is. I did do, um, I was able to take a leave of absence from here for about five months and go to Seattle and work for the National Archives for a little Ooh. while while I was working on my master's, which was really a great opportunity. But those are the only two, two archiving jobs I have had. And I assume it's a master's in history, correct? It's actually a master's in library science. Oh, okay. MLS. So there are two different ways you can go towards archiving. It is just for everyone who doesn't know, the elevator speech, I suppose. Archiving is really just librarian work for really old books and papers. Okay. So essentially we're information specialists. Mm -hmm. We organize information. The information just happens to be old. So you can either go through a course of study in... Uh, library science, library and information science, which is what I did, mm-hmm. or you can go directly to an archival studies program. That just makes you a little bit less, uh, a little bit more tied down. Okay. So I could also work in a library. Oh, okay. Huh. See, I would have thought it was more history, and that's why you... do have an undergraduate in history, and that that helps, Mm -hmm. of course. Um, Some archivists do have multiple degrees in history plus the library science. Mm -hmm. Um, You do have to have a strong background in history to just know what what time frames you're looking at, that sort of thing, when you are processing collections. Um, But the organization of information is as important as the history. Well, that's nifty. So what led you to this type of work? (laughs) National treasure. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, in all seriousness, I have always loved history. My mother was a history teacher. Um, I always excelled in it. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, and I have always liked the idea of uh, treasure hunting. Okay. And would love to do that one day. Um, and when, um, when I moved to Manchester to be closer to my parents, I was going through a divorce. Um, I had been teaching for a while, mm -hmm. did not enjoy it, okay. was not my forte. Mm -hmm. um, I needed to do something else and was trying to think of what I wanted to do. And my daughter and I were watching uh, National Treasure and I thought, yeah, that would be super cool. So I did a good bit of research. I didn't just go off the movie, but um, um, that's basically what we get to do. We have miniature treasure hunts on a regular basis around here. So that's kind of where it started. That's super nifty. That's, <laughs> I in no way did I think you were going to say tre um, National Treasure, <laughs> but that's all right. Well, so aside from this job or including this job, what would you say you're most known for around the Grange? I think just this job, probably. Um, I'm Clark Johnson's daughter-in-law. He's the county historian, and if you aren't kin to him, you were probably taught by him. <laughs> he taught for 35 some odd years. And because I'm not from here, I'm not well known Okay. outside those two things. Well, where are you from originally? Um, I was born in Mobile. My dad's a minister, so we moved around some. Um, I moved to a little town north of Tuscaloosa, Alabama when I was uh, about five. Okay. So I was able to start kindergarten, and we left that, that town when I was a freshman in college. So I was able to start kindergarten and go all the way through high school in one school, which was really nice for wow. a minister's kid. But because of that, I don't really have, quote, unquote, a home. Okay. LaGrange has become home. Okay. So like I mentioned, I've married... Um, married into local people who have been here for all the generations. They were some of the founding founding families of Troop County. So they're home and, and this will be home I think. Okay. So what advice would you give someone wanting to pursue a career similar to yours? Hmm. Read. Read, Read. lots. Read lots. Mm hmm specifically history. Okay. For example, because I grew up in Alabama, I have not had, had any Georgia history classes, Oh. but I am working in a facility that focuses primarily on Georgia history. Okay. And from time to time, that has been a stumbling block. I've had to read up on Georgia history to remember. I had not considered how much having a Troop County history, history yes. lecture series might cause a stumbling block for yes. someone from Alabama. <laughs> yes. Um, state to state does differ. Um, so I would say read, enjoy reading. More than that, though, <laughs> it's not necessarily a skill, but I really think you have to have a passion about it. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit. We, we, I run a nonprofit. There aren't many history fields that pr that offer a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So if you're going into the field, you kind of have to know that it's for the love and yeah. not for the money. Don't want to get rich. Right. So um, so one would need to possess a passion for history. But, um, but other than that, I think everything can be taught. Okay. Yeah. All right, then. So when you first moved to LaGrange, what's the story behind that? Um, I had actually been commuting from Manchester, like moved, physically picked up and moved to, to LaGrange. I had been commuting to from Manchester for several years. Okay. And we moved. I had gotten married to a fellow from here, and we wanted to get our child. At that time, mm. we had one child in school. Okay. And we wanted to get her in better schools. So um, that's really what brought us to the physical move to LaGrange. Okay. Um, before that, like I mentioned before, was the opportunity for the internship. Mm -hmm. But um, I did commute. So. To shorten the commute. Right. Got it. And who would you say are the people that most influential on, influential on you so far? Hmm. 
most influential? Doesn't like have specifically to, be. to my career? Yeah, sure. Or okay. just in general. Um, specifically to my career, my director in Seattle okay. was wonderful. Her name was Patty McNamee. She is Patty McNamee. McNamee. She's not dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she really believes in the value of historical record keeping. Okay. And she was so passionate about it that it was it was contagious. It made everyone around her want to do the best possible job preserving those records. And just to give you an idea, it was uh, stuff like the building plans for dams built on national property, on federal property. Okay. One collection that I processed while I was out there were um, ship ship plans. Mm-hmm. They were one inch to on a scale of one inch to one foot, so they'd be hundreds of feet long. Okay. There were massive, massive drawings that had to be carefully preserved um, for the life of the of the ship. And of course, ships can last mm-hmm. for you know decades. Mm-hmm. And she was so careful to make sure that the science behind it, that everything would last as long as it needed to, that it was it was inspirational. So that's only one. I'm thinking of other people. I had a history teacher in high school. So her name is Miss Gilreath, and I think she was the first to expect our very best and nothing short of that. Um, she pushed hard. It was the hardest class I ever had before I went to college. And so much of what I think of now, I regularly think, huh, I learned that in Miss Gilry's class. <laughs> that was a really long time ago. <laughs> but, yeah, she probably put me on a course towards history more than anybody. That's awesome. Yeah, that was 10th grade. Tenth, I think I had her for 11th, yeah, I had her for 10th and 11th grade. So. As a former history teacher, I really like to hear that. Yeah, I, I hope she... she I might try to tag her or something so that I can make sure she hears it. <laughs> so, what's one common myth about your profession that you'd like to debunk? Hmm. I think people would have to know what we do to even have a myth about us. <laughs> Fair enough. I can't tell you how often I say, well, I'm an archivist by trade. What's an archivist? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. that That it's all fun stuff, maybe? Probably, you know, that all we do is play with, like, I don't know, the swords and the Declaration of Independence and the ruby slippers, you know, that so much of what it is really boils down to just paper. Okay, yeah. So the the easiest records to interpret are paper. Mm -hmm. So, like, a journal from a battle is way easier to tell what's happening than, say, the sword that was used in the battle. Mm -hmm. So, it's a lot more paper than people realize. Yeah, so. it's not all Indiana Jones. Right, right. And all speaking to that, all of that stuff that Indiana Jones does, you have to know that he's done tremendous, or somebody <laughs> has done tremendous research on paper before he ever went to the Temple of Doom or wherever. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> the other myth. I have thought of a myth. Yes. <laughs> So, we also hold all of the local government records. Oh, okay. So, um, and that's really one of the best ways for historical records to be produced is through the government records. Mm -hmm. So, in holding all of those government records, we often, um, I mean, people need copies of those records regularly. So, we often get calls that are like, hey, I need a copy of, say, this, this traffic ticket or this divorce decree or whatever. And they think that we can produce it in 30 seconds by typing it into a computer and it's just going to spit out of a printer. They don't realize that we hold about 45,000 boxes wow. of paper. That's ridiculous. So each one foot by one foot box by 45,000. So you have to actually get up, walk to the box, yeah. scr- you know, scramble through it, find the file, photocopy it. So it takes, it takes a lot longer than most people realize. That's ridiculous. Yeah. 
so. Wow. All right, back to living in the Grange. What do you wish you had known when you first moved to town that you didn't until you got here? That there were so many people not from here. Really? Okay. I had always heard that, <clears throat> let me say it differently, not heard, as I have moved, as I mentioned, my dad was that my dad was a minister, mm-hmm. so we have moved some. Moving into a small town is often difficult because so many people are kind of ingrained. They're kin to everybody. They know everybody. They've gone through school, that kind of thing. So it's difficult to, to meet people, make, make friends, that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people here in LaGrange have moved into LaGrange. And so they fully understand, mm-hmm. you know, the need to make friends and, and step out of comfort zones and that kind of thing. So Yeah, I, out of my 10 interviews so far, only one person has come from LaGrange. Originally. Right, you see? So and maybe that makes the locals a little bit more friendly, too. Mm-hmm. And technically, even he didn't start in LaGrange. He was adopted in. Ah, there you go. So what's your favorite story since you've been living in the Grange? Favorite story? I live a pretty mundane life. I don't know. <laughs> um, favorite story? I'm trying to think. How about I tell you one of the legends that we get? Okay. So all of my stories are of a historical nature because I do live such a mundane life. Um, but we regularly get questions about the tunnels that run to, run under the city. There aren't any. But on a regular basis, I'd say once every three to six months, we have someone, someone come in and say, I want a map of the tunnels. What tunnels? You know, the tunnels, the ones that run from... And they have all kinds of different stories, like from the college to the square or from the college to where the old depot used to be. Well, why would there have been tunnels? So people could escape. What? <laughs> there are no tunnels. Um, they thinking we, Underground Railroad? You see, that's, that's not even a literal term. There was never, like, an underground anything. Well, it yeah, was just it, hidden. But, like... But no, I, that that's wouldn't, what I'm, I, I, that wouldn't have started. I mean, it might have. I, I know Underground Railroad wasn't literal, but. But it doesn't start here. You know, it would have been farther up north yeah. that you saw, like, more of that being used. I have no idea where they get these ideas. We do have one theory. I mentioned earlier about the 45,000 boxes. We have a storage site over near First Methodist, it's okay. the old CNS bank vault that was built underground. Uh-huh. It was built right after the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 60s. Okay. And it was a pretty big to-do when they built it. Mm-hmm. So there are front page newspaper articles and that kind of thing, photographs. And I think that that's maybe where it started, that people saw those articles and in their memory have confused it with other things. But contrary to popular belief, there are no tunnels. Tunnels under the town. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of crazy. Right? Huh. All kinds of other neat things have happened. Uh, In the 1920s, we had a lady fly an airplane upside down down Main Street. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. How far above Main Street? Um, I'm not sure. Pretty close. Okay. Like she did it. She was. She was. It was close enough to be a down Main Street. Right. Okay. Um, Main Street was a little bit lower then. You know, the okay. buildings on Main Street would have been a little bit lower. Some of the other neat stories. I mean, I have I have so many that I'm having trouble choosing. <laughs> have you heard of the Nancy Hearts? Nope. Okay. Then I'll tell you about the Nancy Hearts. Um, it's kind of one of our claim to fame. So the story is that, um, of course, if you're you're a former history teacher, mm-hmm. okay, so then you know Abraham Lincoln is shot, what, April 9th, 1865? Um, but, of course, it takes a while for the knowledge of the, the end of the war of... I taught world history. Oh, so you don't know anything? Oh, man. See, I had to learn all of this, too. <laughs> so, Civil War, it ends April 9th, 1865. Abraham Lincoln gets shot. 
the only way to communicate with the rest of the, the rest of the at that time country was telegraph. So it takes a while mm-hmm. to disseminate that information throughout the states. So April 17th, um, 1865, after the war has ended, there are still troops marching across the South. Union troops mm-hmm. are marching across the South. Um, a gentleman named Oscar LaGrange, just complete coincidence. He was from Ohio leading a panel, a column of men. Um, they s- stopped in West Point. There was a, a, a battle at West Point um, at the river. And then they continued marching this direction. In 1861, when the war had begun, a group of ladies realized that there were all their men had gone off to fight, and they were left kind of stranded. Mm-hmm. So they started a militia, and they drilled, learned how to fire weapons, that sort of thing. So as Oscar LaGrange is marching his panel column across across West Georgia, they, those ladies, about 40 of them, come out with whatever weapons they could find, um, old hunting rifles and that mm-hmm. sort of thing, and stand in front of them and say, we're not going to let you burn our houses. And the ladies were familiar with Sherman's tactics, Mm -hmm. you know, the scorched earth policy where everything was burned. Mm -hmm. So they were fearful for their homes. LaGrange, Colonel LaGrange and his men were not doing that. They were only burning war support. Okay. So he had no intention of burning their homes and sent them home. But, but according to, to legend and some, there is a little bit of proof. The ladies went out and saved their homes. So... (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, there were a few things. They pulled up, um, pulled up some rails, uh, burned the depot. Um, there was a tannery that was burned. Okay. But they even um, there was a furniture factory that was only making coffins at that point, so they even spared it mm-hmm. so that it could continue making Big coffins. coffins. So yeah, that's a pretty neat story, right? Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So, what is your favorite spot or place in Lagrange? That one is easy. I love Main Street really like Main Street during a festival. There are all these really neat... Downtown LaGrange Development Authority does a really good job of programming. And St. Patrick's Day, there's the Life Festival. There's all kinds of neat things. Life Festival. The LaGrange International Friendship Exchange. If you haven't been to Life, you need to go. When is that? It's usually the first weekend, I think, of September. Is Uh, that like the Foreign Food Festival? It's kind of a foreign food festival, but it's it's more than that. So there's there's dancers, there's uh, musicians. Um, I think last year they had 30 or 35 different countries represented. They have little booths set up. Some of them have food, some of them have trinkets. They all have little information so that you can learn about their, their native countries. Okay. Um, it's just really neat. All right, I'll put it on my calendar for next year. Yeah, I do. I just like the way it's kind of like a big city feel. Mm-hmm but still in a small town so that's been a common theme that's come up uh, yeah that came up with my andy fritchley interview ah that's one of his favorite things about this town too is it's all the big city perks with none of the big city hassle yes without the traffic without having to spend so much on rent or Mm -hmm. mortgage that sort of thing yes it's and if you do want some of the big city stuff we're 45 minutes away Mm -hmm. from atlanta and can pop up there and do it but yeah, my favorite, I, I love Main Street, during, especially during festivals. So what's your favorite festival? Life. Okay, it yeah. is life? Yeah, by, by far, it's really neat. We, and we here at the museum, Legacy Museum opens its doors, so we're able to, people roam in and roam out. It's just, it's just fun, so. And that would probably be your favorite thing, living in or around LaGrange too, right? Mm-hmm. The Very big city so. feel with the small city yeah. price tag. Yeah, yeah, and the the convenience. I mean, it's not just price tag; it's the convenience of being able to man- maneuver easily. Mm-hmm. The lack of worry. I ha- like I said, I've got kids. I love that that I know their their playmates, their classmates, mm-hmm. and their families. I don't have to worry that they're going to get into something they don't need to get into. Mm-hmm. It's just comfortable. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite go-to order at your favorite LaGrange restaurant or bar? 
Uh, that's a tie. Okay. So I'm going to give you two. All right. The salmon salad at Venucci's. Salmon salad at Venucci's. Salmon salad okay. at Venucci's. Crazy good. And when I'm not doing good, the steak <laughs> sandwich at Mari Sol. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And they're both within walking distance mm-hmm. of work. That's not always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Beer or wine? What was the question? Beer or wine? Beer or wine? Neither. Oh, okay. I'm not a big drinker. Okay. Uh, beer's gross. Wine's <laughs> not much better. All right. Fair enough. I do like champagne occasionally, but I'm just not a big drinker. Fair enough. I'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can absolutely leave it in. I don't care. I, I just, I just don't. I was going to ask which you drink and why, but never mind. Um, I went to a Christian school mm-hmm. where, I mean, it was, I mean, Sanford is completely dry campus even now. Mm-hmm. So it was difficult to do any of that. I didn't have the typical, like, state school experience, I guess. Mm-hmm. And so I never really honed in on a drink. And I just don't, <laughs> don't need it. I went to a dry campus too. Did you? But... That doesn't mean it was dry. Oh, no. I, I know that it wasn't. I mean, it was definitely not dry. <laughs> it was just more difficult. I mean, you know, you had to hide it and stuff. And I just never bothered. Part of it was because I was always terrified that I'd get, I'd get caught. Mm-hmm. I was usually goody two cheese. Yeah, I didn't drink either, but it doesn't mean it was dry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where did you go to school? Um, I went to a Christian school in upstate New York called Davis College. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I know of Davis College. Who do I know that went there? I know somebody that went there. I'll have to think on that. I'm almost positive that I know somebody that went to Davis. Okay. Um, crud. I'll think about it in the middle of the night no, and you're send you a Facebook message. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the hidden gem in LaGrange that no one else knows about? And you can't say the, you can't say the archive. I can't? You can't. But it is. It is. I agree. Hmm. Hidden gem in LaGrange. I was going to say the archives. Can I use an item from the archives? Okay. Yay. So we have the oldest cotton bale in the whole wide world. Oldest cotton bale? Right. Truly, it's the oldest cotton bale in the whole wide world. And we can prove it. How, how, do, you, how do you go about verifying the age of a cotton bale? We have newspaper articles when it was sent to the World's Fair in St. Louis. And that makes it the oldest. So there is an almost as old one in Mississippi in an agricultural museum. There is another almost as old one in Louisiana, and also at an agricultural facility. But they cannot prove that theirs is older because they don't have that document. All right. So, yeah. And interestingly enough, we've had people come from Egypt to see the oldest cotton bale in the world. From Egypt? Egypt. They grow cotton in Egypt. Yeah, I, I know they grow cotton in Egypt, but okay. I mean, if you're a cotton grower in Egypt and, like, cotton is your thing. Okay, random questions for fun. Okay. What, what are you most excited about right now? Hmm, our upcoming exhibit, this, and I feel bad because I'm skipping an exhibit. We have an exhibit going up in February to mark the 100th anniversary of uh, Unity Cotton Mill. Okay. But the next one that's going to go up after that in July is on the history of food. Okay. And I'm super excited about it. Awesome. So yeah, it'll go from uh, Native Americans in the area and what they ate and how they cooked it all the way to like Wild Leap coming into town. Awesome. So, yeah, I'm really excited. really cool. And we've got some really cool programming. Um, We are working with um, an interpreter from Williamsburg, Michael Mm -hmm. Twitty, to come in and do some demonstrations of of early techniques and that kind of thing. We are looking at doing a historical happy hour. Okay. And some other food cooking demonstrations, that kind of thing. So I'm just really excited about about that exhibit. I've wanted to do it for a long, long time. And it's finally happening will it cover any fermented beverages or yes. other things that the out the indian the native americans may have smoked and or ate for psychedelic 
effects? It might. I don't, we ha- I've not done any research on that. It will definitely cover fermented beverages. Okay. Um, I don't know about um, other. I'm not saying that they did. Um, they did. Okay. Um, but I have not done research towards that end. Um, one thing I can tell you about the, that I was surprised about the Native Americans is that they had peach trees. That's, um, a, that's cool. Yeah, there were peach pits in um, archaeological digs done under what is now the lake in the mm-hmm. 60s. So I think that that's super neat that they had, like, mm-hmm. peaches. Um, and, yeah, we will, we will definitely cover fermented beverages. Okay. For sure. We found a few <laughs> of, of, that we can document that. If you could be a superhero, what power would you possess? Time travel. Time travel? Yes. It would be way easier to figure out all this stuff here if we could just go back in time and be like, yo, what, what was this? What Fair you doing here? Fair enough. All right, so what is your favorite food? Uh, pasta. Pasta? Pasta. What kind of pasta? Um, like what style noodle? All of it. Like my dad's Italian. My, my grandmother's first generation Italian. Okay. And um, so just pasta, carbs, bad. <laughs> All right, so you don't drink beer, you don't drink wine, you drink champagne occasionally. Occasionally. What's I'm, your favorite beverage? I'm water all the way. I'm so bland. Apparently. I don't even need lemon. Okay. <laughs> all right, last question. Uh-huh. Actually, next to last question. Is there anything I should have asked you but didn't? I don't know. No. I don't think so. What's my favorite color? Red. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. Oh, cool things. All right. So where can our listeners connect with you? Uh, give me examples of that, like social media or? Sure. Okay. Facebook and Instagram for the archives. Okay. Um, and Legacy Museum, both. Uh, I am also on both. Okay. Um, and the first Saturday for our listeners with children? Yes. Um, the first Saturday of every month, we have hands-on history, um, which is, it can be as long or as short as you want, depending on the, on the child's mm-hmm. attention span, of course, but we do a little craft or a little game, and in the process of them learning the game or the craft, they learn a little bit of history. So uh, next month, we are going to be doing um, postcards, uh, Valentine's postcards, and we'll talk about early post, uh, post mail, the early mm-hmm. post office, that kind of thing. Um, this past month, we, um, for December, we did um, Victorian pomanders, and the kids loved it. So, yeah, bring your kids in um, from 10 to 4 on the first Saturday of the month. This has been Shannon Gavin Johnson, and with the troop, you say it. Okay, Troop County Historical Society's Archives and Legacy Museum on Main. Yeah, that thing. All right, guys. (laughs) Have a good day.